hope you enjoyed the morning session. I thought that was really informative about the different kinds of wildlife that's here and everything that's happening. A really great actual example of how wildlife can be protected because the wild or the wildlife here is in the National Trust site, as we said, is this isn't a wildlife crime scene of any sort. The wildlife on the property is is well protected. So things that I mentioned might be happening in, in other areas, and I'll get to the northeast at the end of the talk. But what I'm really going to start with is criminology. What is it as a discipline a little bit? Uh, and how has nature actually been treated in the history of criminology? Um, I just wanted to say first, though, that this is part of a larger festival that's been going on all week. I don't Has anybody gone to any of the other events over the week? Uh, it started on the 3rd of November. And it's funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, which is the main funding body for social sciences, really, in the UK. Um, and just a, a website there, you can read up on all the research that they've funded and, and see the different activities that uh, are going on. But the Festival of Social Sciences is the 10th anniversary, actually. Uh, it's been going on, obviously, for, for that long. And the idea is to bring social science research to the wider public. So not just us academics always talking to each other about what we do, but actually getting it out to, to other people to share the kinds of research and the kinds of uh, activities that are involved in the different disciplines within social sciences. The idea to create discussions and open up the forum to, to everyone to, to have the opportunity to share what we do with the third sector businesses and the public. Uh, so that's the, the little logo down there with the, the Festival of Social Science. Uh, it, it actually ends tomorrow. Um, so there's a few other activities over the weekend, but um, something to look out for next year if you're interested in the, in the kinds of, I, I forget how many hundreds of activities are actually going on throughout the country. Uh, so I'm going to first talk a little bit about what criminology is, and then the, how nature has been addressed as I wanted to focus on this new subfield within criminology called green crime some perspectives on how we can understand uh, humans' relationship with nature is a big part of that that I'll talk about. And then these different sections of how we can think of green crime, um, Rob White's work around brown, white, and green are ways to categorize different kinds of green crime that are going on. And then I'm just going to give a, a little bit of a plug there to a great campaign that's going on about ecocide. So what is criminology? Obviously a, a social science, so rather than a, a life science or a physical science of any kind. Really concerned with human behavior of, and of society as a whole. And criminology obviously is, is really focused on the criminal aspect that, that happens within human cultures. It has been uh, drawn from a lot of sociologists though, so the three that really are credited with entering into the debate around why people commit crime. Emile Durkheim, Karl Marx, and Max Weber. They're the, the theorists that really set the framework for larger social sciences that they got picked up by criminology when it developed later in the, in the 50s and 60s. It's usually thought of as a subsidiary of sociology. That's sort of the main uh, approach that people take to criminology is that it isn't a field of its own. It's actually just a part of sociology. But it's particularly gained its prominence in study around juvenile delinquency at first, but the scope has obviously increased and increased, but it's really focused on the idea of how do we understand why people break laws, how do laws get formed as well, who is it that's making the laws, and then what's the reaction when someone does break a law? That's the kind of early research that was going on in criminology. So the nature of crime and criminal behavior, where, do we, where are the origins of these laws, and obviously there's a lot of different aspects to this. There's uh, cultural dimensions, crime definitions are going to differ between different parts of the world, different cultures, it's going to differ, differ historically, uh, so different time periods, we're going to have different ideas of what crime is. And that's really what criminology is, is particularly focused on. People have pushed that further, though, with not just looking at uh, criminology as a subset of sociology. Uh, this work is taken from, from Greg Barrick, uh, a guy at Eastern Michigan, um, a scholar there, who's, who's trying to push the boundary of saying criminology is much more interdisciplinary than that. We can't just look at sociology 
and people's behavior, what we should actually be looking at are all these other contributions to why people behave the way they do. So he advocates a multidisciplinary way of looking at it. So let's take biology, economics, legal studies, let's add that into our discussion of why people actually commit the crimes that they do. And then the bodies of criminological knowledge are not derived from distinctive sets, so we can't just look at what biology, just look at economics. His idea there is to do a combination of, of all of these different disciplines. He, he actually goes on even further, though, to talk about it being interdisciplinary, uh, because multidisciplinary, you actually still have some remnant of one discipline being treated as being better able to explain something where he advocates if it's interdisciplinary, then we treat all disciplines equally, and that, say, the natural sciences and the social sciences are on par with each other, and they both contribute to, to uh, our understanding of crime. It's also connected to crime control, so how can we prevent crime as well as understand why people do it? And then again, as you see there again, the interdisciplinary theory of behavior. It can apply to, to criminal, crime and criminal behavior. So really taking all the different disciplines and trying to explain why it is people commit crime, and then coming up with solutions to keep people from doing it. Historically, though, criminology has really been defined to what has only been considered by the law. So if it's in the criminal code, then criminology would look at it. As you can imagine, though, there's loads of activities that are harmful, that cause suffering, that are injurious, that are outside the scope of what is defined by the law. So in the 60s and 70s, you have these radical and more critical criminologists pushing that boundary again and saying, let's look beyond the criminal code to all these other harmful behaviors. They challenge that because if we only look within the criminal justice system itself, then we ignore all of the, the crime that is actually perpetrated by states, or by governments, by corporations even, because they have a say in what is actually defined, then it never gets actually recognized as a crime and we would never look at it. So challenging that and trying to expand the discourse to look at just what is, um, not look at only what is in the legal code, but let's look at other harmful behaviors as well. So Downs has called it a rendezvous subject. Um, which is quite nice, because it is loads of interdisciplinary activities, or uh, I'm sorry, issues and concerns, um, and because it is so interdisciplinary, we can't just have one framework in which we can understand it. And in terms of nature then, well, nature and the environment were largely, largely ignored by criminology, but probably up until truly in the 90s when we actually start seeing uh, more focus upon it, but that's partly a reflection of criminology being, as I said, oh, if we only look at what's in the legal code, environmental laws are actually fairly new. They didn't come in until the 60s or 70s. So it was once those legislation came in, some criminologists actually started looking at environmental legislation and exploring that. But in general, it, it wasn't really the subject of much inquiry until fairly recently. And when it did start coming into focus under criminology, most of the criminologists that were looking at it only looked at it through corporate crime or organized crime. So rather than individual harms to animals or nature, the environment, it was looked at under very particular kinds of criminology. So what are corporations doing to hurt the environment or organized crime? And then also you have in the early 90s some work coming out of the states where it was uh, looking at marginalized communities and why minorities tend to have a less healthy environment to live in than the majority, uh, or in that case in where they were doing their research, why white people tend to have better environments to live in than, than minorities. So you also had this in the early features of how the environment was actually looked at in criminology. But then finally when we get to the to the 90s, we have this emergence of a subfield, um, which I declare myself proudly part of. Uh, it's green crime. And green crime, then, is concerned with the environment in particular. It's the main focus of it. And it's dedicated to the studies of around nature in particular. Even within that, though, 
you could imagine that everyone views humans' relationship to the environment differently. And so, even within green crime, we have lots of variations of how the, the scholars that engage with this topic actually engage with it, how they have very different approaches when they do so. So you still find uh, people that are very, as it's referred to, anthropocentric, so it's human-centered. The kinds of issues they are concerned with is when the environment is damaged or destroyed, it has an effect on people. And what is the effect on people? And that's why we should be worried about it, is because there's some kind of human injury associated with it. Others, though, are worried about more biocentric issues. So taking the different tactic, humans are not the center of concern, but that all life it has equal uh, intrinsic value. So everything is valuable. We should be considering every species equally. And that takes, if you take that stance, if you take that perspective, you have a very different view of what crime is, because then it opens up the field to lots of different kinds of crimes, doesn't it? Everything we talked about today of digging badger sets or disrupting bats, all of that becomes available to research if you take a more biocentric kind of view. Ecocentric goes even a step further than not only we have human concern, species concern, but then nature also becomes a concern as well. So the entire system, all those interconnections of organisms, ecosystems that are very complex, water, soil, trees, all of it becomes a possible victim of environmental crime under an ecocentric perspective, because you're worried about all those connections as being valuable. <coughs> Interrupt me with questions too, please. How about false, then, is these three perspectives that you'll see in, in, in green crime literature, if you have a look at it. You have this first idea of environmental justice, and the early work where uh, scholars were looking at minority communities having less healthy environments was under this environmental justice framework. And what it looks at is differences within human populations. So how do we each experience a healthy environment? And that often, uh, as I mentioned, reveals discriminatory aspects to it, that minorities, women, often have access to less healthy environments than, than other people. Species justice, it's trying to ensure the well-being of, of every kind of species. But it doesn't just mean, let's protect the entire population, say, of red kites, but it's also concerned with individual red kite being treated well, so animal welfare issues, and the individual species' right to life. Ecological justice, again, advocates to conserve and protect ecological well-being. So it's where we get this ecocentric perspective that we're worried about the entire ecosystem and preserving it uh, for future generations. So what kinds of crimes are we talking about then? Um, as I mentioned, white, um, Gabriella might be a better expert on this at this point than I am. Uh, brown, white, and green, these, these categories that he's developed so we can conceptualize the different kinds of crimes that are happening. And for Brown, he has the idea of urban spaces and pollution, and what kind of green crimes are occurring there. Air pollution, urban stormwater, uh, our beaches get polluted, how much pesticides are we using on our farms, uh, oil spills, obviously big ones um, such as BP, but up to the smaller issues of smaller incidents of oil spills as well. More pollution in the water, uh, toxic and hazardous waste. I don't know if anyone's read the news this morning. Uh, BBC had an article about Cellfield, is any, the nuclear power plant that's in Cumbria. Uh, they just <coughs> discovered that they've, I guess it's been a controversy for years, they've been going back and forth about how they're going to store all of this nuclear waste that's there. And they have 27 Olympic-sized swimming pools full of radioactive waste. They haven't really been doing anything with the last few years. They don't know what they're going to do, and now it's suddenly come to the fore that they have to figure out something, don't they? It's, it's massive amounts of nuclear waste and in a very pristine area in the lake, so they have to figure out what they're going to do. And this is the kind of thing, if you're interested in brown issues and green crime, that you would be researching and you would be studying, because obviously this has huge consequences uh, for wildlife, environment, and people as well. Uh, 
The white issues around science and technology, and this doesn't necessarily get looked at loads, but I, I think it's really fascinating if, if we start to dig into these issues as being harmful or criminal. What about genetically modified foods? Should we be adding a fish gene into our tomatoes so that they can stay cold for longer? And this is the kinds of modifications that are going on, and, and what's the uh, harm around these kinds of issues. The radiation of our food, uh, cloning human tissue, in vitro processes, genetic discrimination, so can we uh, screen for, or filter for certain kinds of genes in people or in animals, communicable diseases, uh, pathological indoor environments, there's evidence that uh, materials that were around even in all of our office, offices might actually be toxic and we should be calling this to the forefront, we should be raising awareness about that. And then animal testing experimentation, still a lot of vivisection goes on where animals are uh, sliced up and looked at inside to, to see uh, different aspects of it or used in uh, laboratory experiments to test human diseases and that sort of thing. And, and green criminology is questioning this kind of status quo, should we be doing these, these activities? And then green is around the wildlife and the conservation issues. Issues of acid rain, habitat destruction, loss of wildlife, which I'll obviously talk more about in a second. Deforestation about well, logging the forest. So there's not only deforestation, but how are we logging? Are we clear cutting, which is very damaging to the soil and to the environment, or are we taking out individual trees? Depletion of the ozone layer, toxic algae, invasive species, uh, which the, the gray squirrel is a great example of, isn't it? That it came over from America ages ago um, and it has wiped out nearly the red squirrels in this country. And then issues around water pollution, again, um, in relation to the effect on wildlife. Wildlife, particularly in criminology, has really fallen under four different kinds of categories. And the first of those, and, I, and it's really persistent still, uh, and I think Liz reinforced it today, talking about, uh, you know, if you're taking fish out of the stream or you're taking deer from land, it's theft because wildlife is considered property. It's somebody owns it. And that's historically how criminologists have approached it, is that wildlife should be considered as property. So the suffering and loss is an economic one. We don't uh, worry about the deer actually dying, we need to just pay somebody for it because it has economic value rather than in other intrinsic kinds of value. Wildlife also gets talked about in criminology literature as being a prototype of human criminality. So you see often someone's acted violently, they've acted like an animal. The comparison that animals are still violent and that that's why humans are violent because there's some evolutionary aspect to it. There's also, uh, when we could talk about wildlife and animals and criminology, though, uh, the comparison that if you're going to treat wildlife and animals poorly, chances are you're going to treat humans poorly as well. So these studies that have been done that people have abused animals and children often come up to be abuse of adults as well. Uh, serial killers, they, they've done this comparison of that many of them, Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer and some of these other ones, uh, tortured animals as children and then turned out to actually be serial killers. This connection that if you're going to abuse wildlife, you're probably going to abuse people too. Finally, though, we get to the point as green criminology really gained more prominence that animals and wildlife are actually bearers of rights in their own uh, sense. So they are, they have intrinsic value and actually should be given rights similar to people. Even within that, though, there's variations. Even though we might think that individual animals should not be, uh, or should not be the subjects of suffering, we still don't question necessarily the routine use of animals and the exploitation of animals. So we still eat meat, we still wear leather, those kinds of issues that are ingrained within our society. But on some level, that's still acceptable. Some green criminologists, though, are pushing that, again, pushing that barrier further, saying, wait, they should have a right to live life free of any sort of human interference. So we should question meat eating. We should question other uh, industries that rely on animals. 
and abolish all exploitation. We shouldn't be uh, dealing with those, um, we shouldn't be inflicting that kind of suffering or harm at all. And then you have really interesting legislation coming out of places like Switzerland, where they're trying to extend this even to trees. That we shouldn't be able to cut down a tree because that is creating suffering in a particular individual. So can we push this to trees, to even to landscapes, is where some of the research is going now. And of course it always raises the, the uh, complex issue, are human rights actually more important though? And I think a lot of what we talked about today outside is this, this conflict that comes, the human-animal conflict, or the human-nature conflict that happens when people think that they uh, should have access to spaces or should continue on doing the activities that they're doing, and what does that mean for, for wildlife and nature? Wildlife crime that's going on in the Northeast. Uh, if, if there's actually uh, not a tremendous amount, but there is some stuff I just wanted to, to highlight for you in addition to what Liz had said on the talk today. And I got most of this information not only from reading some, some great literature and research that comes out of the, the local charities, so the RSPCA, RSPB, uh, but also from, I've been chatting with some of the wildlife crime officers that are in throughout this area. So they've been telling me that there is some minimal amount of illegal logging that goes on. And you can imagine that's the case, you know, possibly more near Kielder or more isolated areas in Northumberland. Uh, so that's some of the plant issues that are going on. And then the wildlife crime officer mentioned to me that there has been some uh, stealing of orchids at Lindisfarne Island. So orchids are a protected species, but it's still one of these uh, wildlife, one of the wildlife that gets caught up in collectors. People get very obsessive about having different kinds of orchids. So there's some rare and um, less threatened ones at Linda's farm, and, and there have been some people caught taking them there when they shouldn't have been. I'm, I'll talk a little bit more about animals though, and uh, the wildlife crime officer I spoke to, he broke it down into three kinds of things that are going on. There's blood sports in the area, uh, bird crime is, is fairly prevalent, and then, then poaching issues as well. And I've opted not to show a bunch of nasty videos, but YouTube is pretty rife with this horrible kind of blood sport videos that are going on. Uh, the first of those is badger baiting, um, which the wildlife crime officer did say to me is, is very prevalent in the Northeast. And, uh, I'll just quickly say what it is for those of you who don't know. This is where uh, people will either, they'll find the sets of the badgers and they'll either use smoke, firecrackers, or send down small terrier dogs into the set to flush the badger out. The badger's then caught and they use it to fight with their dogs. So it, it's an issue of animal cruelty, obviously, and that the badgers are protected. Um, so the badgers, are quite fierce, but they usually don't survive, um, and the dogs actually don't fare much better, uh, so the, the people are even cruel to their, their own dogs. So badger baiting is pretty bright from in the Northeast, and they're concerned um, that it's been picking up recently. Related to that, I'll just skip to the bottom point there, that not only are they doing this with badgers, they've been incidents in Newcastle in the larger uh, conservation area, as he called it, that uh, Guys going out, I say guys, I don't know if women do it, I, I kind of don't think so. Um, men going out and uh, stealing uh, domestic cats, or capturing foxes and having them fight with their dogs. And this has been happening in allotments in different sorts of areas in the, in the outskirts of Newcastle. Uh, fox hunting still going on that isn't, uh, that has been much more limited, hasn't it, in recent years in the UK, but, but still actually happening in some areas. Hair coursing, where dogs again chase uh, rabbits around, and then dog fighting. So these these uh, status dog species that you might have seen. So your uh, these is it Stafford Bull Terriers that are used, pit bulls, these kind of status dogs, as they're called, used in dog fighting, and then cock fighting as well. So you have two roosters that are fighting, and a lot of this is around uh, well, two things. There is some amount of profit from it because they are betting on them, so it's a gambling form of gambling. But then there is, uh, uh, which I find personally hard to understand, it's entertainment. And, and that's why they're calling it sports. They defend it as being uh, 
part of tradition, human tradition, human culture, is that it's a sport that we should be allowed to continue doing these kinds of things. And that's, as green criminologists, that's the kind of thing we're, we're challenging, we're questioning. Should, should we be allowing these kinds of things to continue? But I opted to show the cute picture rather than the nasty videos. <laughs> the kinds of bird crimes that are going on, so uh, we did mention it earlier, so poisoning. Um, landowners, gamekeepers thinking that particularly that birds of prey are some sort of danger to the wildlife that lives on their property. So there have been poisonings in the area. Shooting and destruction of birds of prey, um, and I'll talk each about these a little bit too, the egg collecting and the, and the um, actually a minor but um, occurring the taxidermy that goes on. So I took this from the RSPB. These are, these are all the birds that have actually been poisoned, birds of prey that have been poisoned in the UK in the last 10 or so years, uh, broken down by country. So Scotland is, is having the greatest in the blue, the greatest uh, number of poisonings. It's still, I mean, it might look quite low, you know, it's 20, less than 20, say, in, in 2002, but some of these populations are so small already that if you're losing 20, 30, individuals out of a population that, that's affecting the, the genetic diversity and the, and the health of that population. So it is a concern even though the numbers might not look too, too large to us. But um, then England and Wales and Northern Ireland less. But, uh, so there is every year consistently uh, pesticides used to kill birds. The shooting and destruction of birds of prey also scattered around the country, again taken from the RSPB. Uh, we, we seem to be quite good, don't we? Like there's a few, but there's like a big blank screen where, where, where we would be. But, uh, uh, but this is a, a variety of things. The destruction, again, is, is poisoning. Uh, but it's not just shooting at the birds, it could be destroying their nests as well. So um, a lot of different things going on. We talked about egg collecting earlier. Here's the photo of the of the recent case we were talking about of the uh, a police officer actually had been collecting eggs for years, and it's one of those things that when reading the case, I thought it was quite odd that he was actually very helpful once he got caught. He was like showing them in his house where he stashed everything and um, some amount of pride in like how well he had done in collecting all of these things, which is, is bizarre to me. But uh, yeah, so all empty. You know, blown out as we were saying earlier, so the, just, uh, just the shells there. Uh, but yeah, um, fairly prevalent. And the wildlife crime officer I spoke to said this is an interesting one because it is all about this obsession around the collection of getting as many uh, specimens as you can. And he, he said they think that there's around 400 egg collectors in the entire country and that they're all part of this society called the Jordan Society, which is named after some. Uh, priest from the medieval times that was an egg collector, and they're kind of carrying on with this tradition of, of egg collecting, and they're, they're quite proud of it. It, it. It's an interesting kind of cultural element to it, um, but they, they do think it's just, just this 400 people, but they travel everywhere. They have people from the Midlands and from the South coming here to find particular species, so they're, they're very uh, dedicated in, in traveling into the different parts of the country for specific species. And then you have um, trade in wild birds and taxidermy. So you have people specifically that go out and catch live finches and bullfinches uh, for trade and sale. And then you also have people that um, engage in illegal taxidermy. So actually having, again, around a collection kind of thing of stuffed uh, different kinds of, of birds. Also happening in the Northeast, though. Uh, England, Scotland, Wales there again. So. The incidence of the types above, and this is referring to, to the entire of those four things I said, so the poisoning, shooting, uh, taxidermy, and egg collecting. So England here is, is leading those kinds of events, or incidents, and this is all reported to the RSPB, which is an interesting aspect of UK wildlife law enforcement, is this, it doesn't necessarily fall to a police officer, that the RSPB has investigated import, export, uh, egg collecting and thefts. So, uh, some 
increase up till to 2009, and then it looks like it's dropping again. And then, of course, we can <coughs> speculate as to why that is. If they're getting better at catching it, or they've just killed alders and there's none left to take. Uh, this is just the, the local uh, um, data, so northern England there, and the uh, it's um, birds of prey is this column, and then other sorts of birds, and then the total. So you can see Northumberland had six birds of prey uh, killed in 2011, this data is from. Um, but you can see Lancashire is particularly high in North Yorkshire as well, is where uh, a lot of the birds of prey are actually being killed. The kind of poaching going on, we did mention this, uh, so there is deer poaching in the Northeast. Um, I've been trying to do collect data on that for quite a while now, and the wildlife crime officers have been very forthcoming, but this issue of gamekeepers, they, they seem to be a little more reticent to talk to me, and, and maybe that's, I don't know, I couldn't speculate why really, but the, they are also play a large role in, in preventing poaching, because they're uh, essentially rangers on private land. They have control and, and uh, authority over that, that piece of land. But also poaching of game birds, so pheasants, grouse, those sorts of things. And then fish poaching as well, um, meaning from rivers. It didn't even get into, there's probably loads of overfishing in, in the North Sea too. Uh, but this is particularly around rivers. And the wildlife crime officer is telling me it's, it's mostly for personal consumption, people just doing it for themselves. But there is some amount of profit uh, in it as well, whether they're selling it to other people or selling it to pubs actually. So, or to, into farmers markets, which is, I would argue, is a bit concerning because deer in particular can carry wasting diseases that are light foot and mouth disease. And if you're not going through proper veterinary inspections, you're going to be risking some, some issues around human health there as well. That's what's happening in the Northeast and sort of the criminology element to it. I just wanted to, to end with a bit of a plug of a recent uh, campaign that started up. So, has anyone been following Polly Higgins lately? She's gaining a bit of prominence uh, in the UK. She's actually a barrister that's been petitioning the UN to add ecocide as a fifth crime against peace. So, historically, uh, right after World War II, you have the introduction of the first three there, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and genocide, as being a way, you know, just that all the UN members sign on to this, saying that these are unacceptable, unallowable. And recently, only in 2010, crimes of aggression have been added on, which I feel like, I don't know if that's the US's fault of going into Iraq. I feel, I feel like there's a connection. But then there's her proposal of what about when the environment is just absolutely devastated and completely destroyed? Shouldn't we be concerned with that? Her argument is then that this should be the fifth crime of peace. And she's been, as I said, petitioning the UN for it. Um, I saw her speak in Newcastle a few weeks ago, actually. Greenpeace invited her. Uh, she's at the Star and Shadow. So she, she makes rounds around the country giving talks about it. So uh, Ecoside, and, and she's got her campaign going of, of uh, how she's pushing this forward is imagine it's 2020 and we've finally gotten Ecoside to be a crime of peace. And she's calling it Wish 20. Um, and you can visit that End Ecoside website just to see. Uh, she's trying to get parliaments around the world to actually sign on to it because you need a certain number of countries within the UN to agree to it, to have it be voted on and then um, approved to be the fifth crime of peace. So she's really making an effort one by one to get all these countries on board with it. I'm going to end there, though, if you have any questions, uh, and if we could do evaluations, please, we'd love some feedback on the day as to what you thought we could have done differently, what you liked, all of that, yeah? Consider yourselves the, the greenest of the green chronologists, if uh, or, or do those people, you know, among the uh, the people that so you've got the three different colors of uh, yeah. green criminology. Are yeah. the if is anyone focusing on green? Consider them extra green. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a gray, isn't there? That um, 
Uh, they were mentioning in the EOS SCA. Oh, right, someone proposing another, yeah. yeah, another category. Yeah. But it's a bit sort of, at the moment, it's a bit wish washy about like, talking <laughs> about perhaps having too much personal in the water that you're pumping out from your house that would then go into the water. Or, well, like, in, in the case of London, I think we'll come under what they talk about grey crimes. Um, the contraceptive pill is creating <laughs> high levels of estrogen in the water. Yeah, yeah. So. Everywhere now. Mm. Everywhere we've got to be. It's, yeah. Yeah. Mm. it's like the link that they cause an um, severe hormonal problem with women and men rather than women. Yeah. Yeah. Um, are we the greenest of the green? Well, I think the greenest of the greens would be the people that look beyond just what is normal. I find it very restrictive and uh, when people only look at what the legal code is telling us rather than looking at uh, what else is actually causing harm. Like clear cutting, for instance, is a terrible way to actually undertake logging, but it happens all the time. It's perfectly legal, even though it's incredibly destructive.